Oh, good morning, Emma and Bry Guy. And good morning to all the rest of the folks that have not popped into the live chat yet. I'm still getting this prepped. This has been a long journey, and I've communicated with some of my inner circle people about this project. I talked with Emma and a couple of other folks, and I said, this has been a project that has really, truly put me to the test. I ran into so many walls with this machine. And this machine, if you don't remember, it came to the workshop by way of Texas because the owner was trying to operate it and all of a sudden heard a big bang in the back of the machine and discovered that the capacitor that is wired into the motor had exploded. I mean, literally exploded and uh, ended up damaging a number of the motor components. It was a big, big project. And through further investigation, I, I discovered as well that there was an issue with this capacitor that is built into the foot controller on the Swedish Beauties. There's capacitors and resistors that are part of that wiring matrix. You can kind of see in this bag, these are some of the other components that typically are going to be intermingled into the foot controller and they serve a number of different purposes they help with the motor startup so that the motor starts up and you get immediate nice even flow of power but they also will function like this component right here that created a lot of problems for patty landers out of texas what this one does in the foot controller is it it backs up that electricity and temporarily stores it. And then what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to evenly distribute that power from the foot controller to the motor. This little thing right here, if you can imagine as tiny as this is, using my caliper, I can tell you that it's only about 21, 22, 23, about 24 millimeters, 24 millimeters long. Circumference is about close to 15 millimeters. Does anyone want to venture a guess with a little component like this that serves as a capacitor in the foot controller, how much energy this little device can build up? It's almost acting like a dam a dam on a, a water source, and it's holding that electricity back like a dam. How much energy from a standpoint of volts do you think this little gadget can hold back in that foot controller until it releases it evenly and in a controlled manner to the motor, which it didn't do? It was like the dam broke and that energy that had been built up in here shot to that motor, hit that capacitor, and that capacitor in that motor in Patty Lander's machine went boom. How much energy, how many volts does this little gadget hold back? It's not a very big gadget. This capacitor that's in the foot controller, what do you think it can hold? What do you think it can store? And what what do you think it's, you know, it can hold back as far as that dam function? Number of volts, what do you think? Come on, you guys. 
Be courageous. Be courageous. This is a little capacitor that is was in Patty Landers' foot controller. How much energy, from a standpoint of volts, can this little capacitor hold back in that foot controller? Again, it acts like a dam. It acts like a dam on a waterway, and it's holding back that electricity like this. And what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to trickle it out. It's supposed to trickle it out as it's holding that, that reservoir of energy back, and it's supposed to trickle it gently into that capacitor that feeds that 1.5 amp Swedish motor. But it didn't do that. It was a naughty, naughty, naughty capacitor. And really, this is a dual function device. It's a capacitor and a resistor in one. Normally, the Swedish would use one of each in a foot controller. And if you've ever opened the back of your foot controller, you'll see two components like this. One is a capacitor, one is a resistor. And the resistor is supposed to be that stop safe that will restrict how much electricity can enter that foot controller and then use that as a gateway to get to the motor itself. This particular foot controller was set up with an older style that served as a dual duty and it failed. It failed in a major way. So how many volts? What do you guys think? Emma, Emma's saying 240 volts. And Emma's revising her guess to 120 volts. I'm going to type into the chat and blow you guys away as to how many volts a little device like this or even a littler device like this can store up in that foot controller, holding it back like a dam. And it's, what it's supposed to do again is trickle that energy evenly to that motor to give that motor just a nice startup and a nice running even RPM pace. As you push on that foot controller and that rheostat that's built into these foot controllers again, Foot controllers like these that are Husqvarna, right about in this region right here, there's going to be a rheostat field, almost like you'll see in the older foot controllers that'll have a series of wires. And I showed you guys on Facebook where one of those foot controllers, I had to rewire that entire foot controller with those leads of wires that serves as a rheostat. And as that, uh, that little electrical meter moves across them, it's going to create or decrease resistance and cause that motor uh, energy to fluctuate and go up and down. It basically is a, it's, it controls that speed, doesn't it? But on this foot controller, that rheostat field is embedded into the Bakelite inner core. It's, it, it, it basically is embedded in there. And as it moves up and down, it's going to control that field of energy so that as you push on the foot controller, it's going to allow that rheostat to cause that motor to go up or down in speed. It's it's a it's like a it's like a pedal on your car basically. And inside of there, before that rheostat can do its job, inside of here, there's a capacitor and a resistor like these that will either retard the amount of voltage ca that can go through, or it will store it temporarily and then feed it slowly into that motor. This one again, where did I put it? Did I lose it? <laughs> oh, there it is. This one again was a dual duty device that served both as a resistor and as a capacitor. So let me finally answer the question after all of my blah, blah, blah. How many volts can a little device like this store up and basically pack it in there and then it's supposed to trickle it out let me type in the chat you guys are going to be blown away bry guy is saying 300 you guys aren't going to believe this but it's absolutely true depending on the style of the capacitor resistor it's going to be able to store up between and i'm typing it in the chat right now All right. Hope you're sitting down because this is a mind blower.
I just I just posted it. So if if you're watching this after this live stream and you're going, what did he write? What did he write? What did he write? This little device can store up between 1,500 volts and 2,400 volts. This particular one that was in Patty Landers, and this one was made by a company called Jensen, which is actually a company that was based in Denmark. Actually based in Denmark. And this dual duty one that serves again as a resistor, it's kind of a stop point, and also as a storage device, can store as much as 1,500 volts. And again, when you plug something into the wall, you assume that the max output, you assume that the max output of whatever you're plugging into is as high as the volts can go, right? I, I would have assumed the same thing. So if you're plugging into a wall in the U.S., it's going to generally be 110 to about 120, 125 volts coming out of that wall. If you're over in Europe, it can be as much as 230 to 250 volts. But again, the, the majesty of a device like this is that it can take that energy as it's coming from that power source and compact it in here. It can basically compress it in there and build it up 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 and build it up, build it up to a point where it actually exceeds what the original source of that power was. And this one again can can store and retard about 1500 volts. Can you imagine? I mean that that's mind blowing, isn't it? That all of that energy is like a dam is being held back in in the confines of this little device. And these devices over here that are later models can actually store and retired even more energy than that. These, I believe, and I have to look at the specs on them, but they can hold back about 2,500 volts. I mean, you can do the math and say, well, how many watts is that? What kind of energy are we talking about? It's enough energy that when one of these devices fails, it can result in this device on the motor, which is metal cased. This is metal cased, and then it has an inner core that allows that, that energy in this motor. It's usually snapped into there. It can allow the energy in that motor to be stored back so that when you push on that foot controller, this motor starts up nice and even, and then it allows that reservoir of electricity without any surging to feed this motor, and in concert with the foot controller right over here, it allows that motor to just be silky smooth. But when, when one of these devices fails, particularly the one that is the gateway for the motor on the foot controller, again, remember the electricity starts flowing through the foot controller and then it's fed to the motor. So when you have a capacitor or a resistor that fails in one of these Swedish foot controllers, it can all of a sudden cause an energy surge to this motor that apart from this capacitor taking the hit could basically, I mean, could cause this entire motor to all of a sudden flame up and to catch on fire. Because you're talking about between 1,500 volts and 2,400 volts that are being held back again by these, or in Patty Lander's case, I keep losing that little thing. What is wrong with me? <laughs> So on Patty, Patty Landers, about 1,500 volts were being stored and held back, retarded by this capacitor inside of the foot controller. If all of a sudden that capacitor or resistor fails and you have that flood of backed up energy all of a sudden surge to this, it doesn't matter if this is metal cased or not, that puppy's going to go because you talk about an energy force that is absolutely mind-blowing. Absolutely mind blowing, and that's what happened, and scared the the Dickens out of these folks that were hoping just to be able to operate the sewing machine. So, 
I won't blah, blah, blah about this anymore, but I really want you guys to understand these components, when they work, it's beautiful. When they have a catastrophic failure, it can be game over. And uh, the motor that is in Patty's machine had to go through some major rebuilding because, again, that motor capacitor exploded when it got hit by about 1,500 volts that were, was being held back or should have been held back by this. And all of a sudden, you've got a major, major uh, hazard uh, that can, can hit, that, hit that sewing machine. And the operator, the operator is only about a foot away from it when that happens, right? So it can be pretty doggone scary. So let me set this, this motor. I just had these out for illustration so you can understand kind of what happened. And when I went through this machine, I found pieces of the capacitor as far up as by the light assembly all the way over here. And the motor's on the back. But when it exploded, it basically sent almost like a roadside bomb. Like a roadside bomb, it sent shrapnel from this capacitor that blew up throughout the entire machine. It was a, it was a major search and destroy to find all of those pieces of this device. There was little or none of it left. And you'll see that. I'm going to turn the camera around. We're only going to look at a few progress shots, and I'll post the rest of the progress shots. I think I have another six or seven sets on Facebook that I posted. And in the description for this live stream, I'll put all of those links so you can look at it. You need to understand when a machine comes into the workshop, basically on a flight for life from Texas, it comes on a flight for life from Texas to the workshop because of this major explosion that happened inside of this Swedish beauty. Um, I mean, I document a lot of those things that I've done to the machine because it helps you understand how we finally get to this point of premiering the machine and showing it do its Swedish strut. But there's a lot of stuff that happens before that, a lot of stuff. Let me set down all these things in my hands, bring that out of the way. And again, we're only going to look at a few, a few very limited progress shots. So again, you can appreciate where we started. Where did things start with this machine when it was taken out of the box from Texas? I'll shut off some of these lights because we're getting a lot of reflection. There we go. That's a little bit better. So when a machine arrives, I, you know, I know a little bit of what's happened because of what the owner has told me, but I don't know the full story. So here I am starting to tear the machine apart. I've taken the base off. I pulled the motor and I'm starting to inspect what, what actually has happened. And I'll just kind of go through these fairly rapidly because you guys are smart. You can figure out kind of what we're looking at. There's part of that inner core of the capacitor and there's metal uh, inside of there as well. And that stuff went out like shrapnel. There's part of the innards of it as well. You can kind of see that in the shot. That's just me being silly. <laughs> Those are the characters. If any of you are Peanuts fans, if any of you are Charlie Brown fans, those are the young lads that actually played those characters in those classic series that most everyone around the world has watched. So it's kind of fun to see the real faces of those kids, isn't it? Just continuing to look at that motor and just figure out what's happened to it and what's going on. And there you can see the actual specs on this for the capacitor that was built into that motor. It's able to store back once that foot controller capacitor and resistor release that energy to it this little capacitor that blew up was able to store up to about 1500 volts you can see that near the, the top of the shot which means the surge that went into that capacitor even exceeded 1500 volts otherwise it should have been able to manage it 
uh, and it couldn't. So it just totally, boom, went out. More inspection of the motor to try to determine, begin to determine what actually is going to have to be replaced on it. Trying to do a bypass and see how many motor components have been affected. And it turned very, very roughly. Oh, wow, that's even blurry there. Turned very roughly when it was first plugged in. You can actually see right there a little bit of plastic that actually looks like it's glazed. That's from the heat when that flash happened from that explosion. There it is again right there. Must have bumped something. At any rate, you guys get the idea. I won't belabor that. I'll put the link in there for that one as well, so you can kind of look at it and uh, and just see what impact that had. And I can see by our our falling numbers in the live stream that some people are are soas, but they're not necessarily wanting to be technicians and understand the technical side of things. So uh, I get that. I get that. But I, I want you guys to understand that. A, a machine that's running well can be a, a delight. A machine that has a catastrophic failure like this can be a ticking time bomb. And that's kind of what Patty Landers and her husband down in Texas experienced with this machine. All right. Set this stuff back here. Put this foot controller back on the floor. Some of these lights back on. So what we're going to be doing with this machine today is primarily going to be leather based. Um, those are the samples that I've cut. I could grab some cotton real quick, but I, I haven't prepped any cotton yet. Well, I can see that uh, Bry Guy and Emma are the only ones, I think, that have entered the live chat so far. I think they are. All right. And I'll try to see if I can get the camera a little bit closer than we are right now. So again, this is a, uh, a CL21A, and CL uh, is simply a prefix on the nomenclature plate to say that it's a class 21. And then they ended up using a different character on some of these machines. You'll occasionally see them where it looks like a CI, but that also means class as well. So it's a class 21. This particular one came out in 1959. And inside of the faceplate here, if we kind of look inside of there real quick, if you're not familiar with Swedish Beauties, they're going to be putting the serial number right here adjacent to the take-up arm. And it's printed vertically on the inside casing uh, of the machine. I'll kind of get a little bit closer so you can see it right about, I'm looking at the camera too. Yeah, right about there. There it is. So if you, if you ever wondered how to find the serial number on a Swedish beauty, it's right there. But here's the problem you'll run into is the record keeping from the Husqvarna company over in Sweden was not the greatest. It definitely was not brag worthy. It definitely was not brag worthy. And uh, as a result, 
trying to uh, date these machines is a very difficult task. But I was fortunate enough through my friendship with Hans, who's from Norway, that he was able to provide some confidential documents to me from the original factory. And so if you're ever at a dilemma with your Swedish beauty and you're really not sure, a lot of people will look at these green machines and they'll say, oh, it's from the 1950s. But if you want to narrow it down further than that, um, I've got those records, confidential records that Hans shared with me. And, uh, and I'll be happy to, if you send me the serial number again, just open the faceplate on your Swedish beauty, write down the entire serial number and email it to me, or you can send it through Facebook messenger, or for that matter, you could even call me up and give it to me over the phone. I'll tell you what year your machine was made. And that's accurate. The records that I have are accurate through about 1962. And then you have to kind of go with brackets after that in order to date the machine. But again, the Swedish were brilliant engineers and designers in coming up with these machines, but they didn't do as grand of a job in their record keeping. Not nearly as good. So... All right, so let me do this. Let's actually put this machine to work. And I'm gonna start with a real basic uh, straight stitch and a zigzag on this machine. And then we'll launch into some of the more decorative fun stitching that the various cams <clears throat> that go with this Swedish beauty can do. Now the ones that Patty sent with the machine are the basic set that would have been issued with the machine, cams A, B, C. And beyond that, there's also a D cam and then an E cam. The D and the E cams are really the unicorn cams for these green machines. Uh, I have a couple of each and actually had an additional D cam that you might remember as a thank you to Hans for uh, helping me on the Facebook page and, and being a great resource when he was doing it. Um, he was searching high and low over in Europe for a D cam and couldn't find one. I had an extra one, so I kind of surprised him. I mailed it to him in Norway and sent him one of the D cams so that he had A, B, C, D, and E. He already had an E cam, but did not have a D cam. So, all right, blah, 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 blah. This is saddle grade leather. <clears throat> and this stuff is right around three to four ounces thick. Kind of see it from the side there. And three to four ounces of leather is nothing to scoff at. It's, um, I mean, it's it's definitely well beyond what a lot of people sew in the garment leather region. This stuff is, is the thick of thick when it comes to a machine being able to go through it. But you know what? We're talking about a Swedish beauty. We're talking about 1.5 amps. And now that you understand the concept of the resistors and the capacitors, and you realize that they can reserve and hold back as much as 2,500 volts, it gives you an idea of that grit as those devices are releasing that energy through the foot controller to the motor, why these have such a sustained, powerful punch when it comes to sewing through leather like this. They just do, surprisingly so. Um, there's a gentleman, a local gentleman, that was looking to do all kinds of upholstery work and uh, needed a machine that could get the job done through multiple layers of stuff. And initially he was, wasn't skeptical, but he was like, really, really? Those machines have that much power. Uh, yeah, they do. They've got a lot of power. Okay. So about three to four ounces of saddle gray leather, we're laying down a straight stitch to start. And then we're going to launch into a zigzag on this saddle gray leather. And then eventually we're going to move into some protected full grain leather and have fun with the decorative output of this machine as well. And you can see getting ready for this premiere after battling all the things with this machine, I've already done a number of sew offs. Uh, this is a type of protected full grain leather, saddle grade leather, genuine elk hide, and then finally another version of protected full grain leather as well. So I've already kind of run it through the paces and put that machine and the needle uh, you know, through the races and through the paces. So hopefully she does okay with a quickly tiring needle. All right, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. 
And I'm not going to start it with any hand start. You can see across the machine, we're just going to hit the gas and uh, lay down a straight stitch through this three to four ounces of protected full grain leather. And I'm going to, I'm going to do something intentionally so you can hear kind of how that capacitor and resistor work together as they're starting to release that energy. Listen real closely. And I'm going to even shut off the heater. It got a lot colder in Wisconsin all the way down to a point where they're saying the wind chills over today and tomorrow are going to be near zero. And we're supposed to be in spring now, but Listen to this machine as it's starting to um, uh, actuate that motor. You'll hear a humming. Listen real closely. Can you hear that? That's that capacitor resistor doing its job of holding that stored voltage back, and it slowly starts to release it to that motor. That didn't happen for Patty when that component failed. It just, boom, let it all go at one flow and took that motor and capacitor out. Okay, here we go. Let's listen to this machine run totally quiet in the workshop and listen to it do its job beautifully. Here we go. That is what a Swedish beauty is supposed to do. That's what a Swedish beauty is supposed to do. And I can see that it's a beautiful stitch, beautiful stitch top. Oh, I actually sewed through a, a dating label on this leather as well. Interesting. Uh, it's a beautiful stitch, but I'm seeing that that upper tension might be up a little bit too high because that top stitch does not have the level of definition that we would want it to have. The lock stitch looks spot on, but that top stitch is is good, but it's a little bit on the weak side kind of show you guys what I'm looking at. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to back this off a little bit so that that top stitch has even better definition. Let me see if I can hold it up to the camera. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it clearly uh, or not, but the top stitch is looking good, but it could be better. I've got to kind of look over my shoulder here. And then when I turn it to the edge again, you can see the thickness of what we sewed through. Nothing catastrophic compared to what you've seen on this channel. But then if I turn it over, you can look at that lock stitch. And the lock stitch is very, very nicely defined. A little bit too overdefined. And again, if your upper tension is turned up too high, you're going to get a really nice defined lock stitch. But it's almost going to be a little bit compressed where that upper tension is pulling up so hard that it actually condenses or shortens that stitch a little bit and makes it compressed. And that's your cue that you need to back off that upper tension a little bit, depending on what you're sewing. So it's a real simple fix. And I've already backed off that upper tension a little bit. So we can give a little bit more power back to that bobbin case that's trying to pull down. And again, if you're brand new to sewing or brand new to VSM, and you're going, wait, 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 wait a second. Why are you talking about the bobbin case and talking about this upper tension up here? What does that have to do with the sewing process? It's got a lot to do with the sewing process. And it's because if your upper tension is pulling up too hard, you're going to get a, a real nice defined lock stitch, but you're also going to get, I'm going to put out a little bit of music. Try to put on a little bit of music. Is that real? Wow, that was weird. <laughs> that was really weird. I don't know what that was. It sounded like an old Pac-Man game. So what I was beginning to explain, again, not to insult anybody's intelligence, because I know a lot of you, when you started attending these classes, didn't understand the concept of how the tension works. It's a constant tug of war. So this upper tension unit here, as you increase the number on it, it's going to be pulling up harder and harder and harder the higher that number goes. And then as you adjust the bobbin case and you turn that little adjuster screw in so that there's more pressure on that bend spring, 
that that thread flows underneath, that's going to be creating more and more definition for that top stitch. So this is pulling up to define the lock stitch. The bobbin case is pulling down to define the top stitch. So you have to get that balance where they're working together. The upper tension is not pulling up too hard. The bobbin case is not pulling down too hard. And you get a beautiful stitch where that knot is right in the middle of the two layers. So that's how it kind of works. So I've had experienced seamstresses that have contacted me almost in tears as they're battling a new material they're trying to sew with, or maybe they're using a, a different type of thread and they're battling, let's say they're battling having a real nicely defined top stitch. Well, instead of adjusting the upper tension down, they've gone the opposite way and they've made the problem even worse. So as soon as you understand the tug of war principle, this is pulling up this down here, the bobbin case is pulling down. You can generally fairly easily balance the two, making adjustments, usually with the upper tension, and get that stitch balance between top and bottom spot on. Makes sense? I think so. I hope so. Oh, we got a, we've got a new person. Uh, I, I just glanced over at the chat real quick. A.W. A.W. So let me read A.W.'s question, see if I can try to answer it. Could you maybe tell us about the rubberized metal rubber mount? Uh, does ovaling, excuse my word, not a native speaker, cause issues for belt belt tensioning um not not necessarily and what uh aw is talking about is when oops i just took out our guy sorry about that dude what aw is talking about is in the back of a swedish machine like this one that belongs to patty landers there's going to be uh as the motor is mounted I, i'll actually turn it like this because this is the way it would be uh positioned uh, inside of the machine itself. As it's positioned like this, on the right side of the machine, there's going to be a rubber boot that this motor kind of slips into. And then on the other side, there's also a, a mounting point as well. You can kind of see that from the screw points on the bottom of there. It anchors in a fixed position. So generally, the belt tensioning is not going to be grossly affected unless that rubber boot is in such poor condition that it's allowing the motor to pitch when you push on the foot controller and it, it actuates the motor. And let's say that rubber boot that's kind of slides over this part right here is so shot. It's so worn out that it's not holding that motor in a fixed position. Then you've got to come up with a solution, either replacing that rubber boot or you could galvanize that by using something like a liquid rubber uh, that's oil resistant. Uh, again, you don't want to go with a generic liquid rubber or an RV style liquid rubber because they're not going to be designed to resist oil or heat. And a lot of those uh, uh, black, uh, black liquid rubbers, they make them black because it, they, they want them to stand out as something that will be uh, able to work in a motor space without allowing that uh, uh, oil rich environment to degrade that liquid rubber more rapidly. But again, if that rubber boot is not holding this motor in a fixed position, then that motor, when you step on the foot controller might be pitching and it will affect that belt tensioning. And these, these um, you remember we talking about the bobbin case, right? The bobbin case, or excuse me, not the bobbin case. Uh, the bobbin winding assembly, the bobbin winding assembly has a tensioner on it that a lot of people don't use. And it's on the right side of the machine. I don't know if I can show you one or not. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can grab one. Okay, I got one. 
so especially if you have a if you have a, a machine that is, is having issues with this rubber boot on this end that that our friend aw is referring to it goes right over this area kind of holds this motor in a fixed position if you're having issues with that you may be able to compensate assuming that the motor is just out of alignment a little bit and it's not pitching every time you push on the foot controller then you've got more of an extreme issue going on but what you can try to do is you can try to manage that until you can come up with a solution for that rubber boot issue you can try to manage it as this is in the machine this little spring right here and this one is kind of deformed this is not a usable spring uh attaches to a little lever that's mounted to the case the the inside body of the case of the machine and you can adjust it up or down to create more tension that will tighten up the belt that's what this spring is for and a lot of folks will just leave it kind of free hanging i've gotten a, a lot of swedish beauties in the workshop where it's not connected but that will help you as well to create a little bit more horizontal tension on that belt to try to compensate for the failure of that rubber boot. But again, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to do something about that rubber boot because otherwise what's gonna happen is even if you're able to operate the machine, this motor, instead of being positioned true and allowing that belt to run uh, in proper alignment, what's gonna happen is the belt is gonna be running a little bit, as my father would have said, cattywampus. Not sure that's a real word, but I believed it was because dad said it all the time. But it'll allow that belt to not run true over to this pulley over here. This is kind of how they're going to be lined up inside of the machine. And this will be pitching a little bit because of the failure of that rubber boot. And then it's going to cause very rapid wear uh, on that belt. It's going to be running not true from this pulley to this pulley. And it's going to result in that belt prematurely wearing. It's also going to create a lot of strain on the motor too, because it's creating drag and resistance. And that motor is having to work a lot harder to try to compensate for that. And in extreme situations, even apart from a capacitor resistor combo failing in the foot controller, like it did for Patty Landers that landed this machine by, uh, I joked around, I think on Facebook and I said it landed it by uh uh, basically a medevac flight from uh, Texas to Wisconsin. Uh, but if a motor has to work too hard over an extended period of time, it can also cause uh, the components like a capacitor to start overheating as well. And that could also cause a catastrophic failure also. So again, it just shows you when, when something is working well. And that's why, that's why when I get a Swedish beauty like this in the workshop, I take it through about 130 steps of servicing inspection adjustments to try to eliminate those factors so that when the owner gets it back like patty down in texas she doesn't have to be worrisome about all those factors she can just sit down and enjoy the machine but when you're dealing with something like this where these depend on each other the foot controller and the motor depending uh, depend on each other and you've got a lot of factors that can come into play it can result in issues uh, just as this machine experience coming into the workshop. So hopefully that answers AW's uh, question. And again, you'll if you can't get a rubber boot replacement, uh, then you could always uh, help to anchor this in place so that it's not pitching when you push on the foot controller. Because again, there's a lot of torque. When this spins up, there's a lot of torque between this output pulley and that belt going across. And obviously I'm showing you a bobbin winding assembly. Some of you that... Are, are really, really attentive right away. We're probably saying, okay, I, we get the concept, but these are not compatible. And that's absolutely true. And let me explain that a little bit further for those of you that miss that. Uh, when you've got a cogged type output pulley like this, it's generally going to be on an E-series green machine. It's going to be on a 19E special. It's going to be on a 21E it's going to be on one of those E series machines where they got a lot of complaints from people about a standard V style belt slipping on that standard pulley. And so they graduated then into the idea of starting to make a cogged output pulley. And then they would also give it a, a cogged uh, 
uh, joining point over here for the belt to go on to. So instead of this being smooth, it would look similar to this in being cogged. And then you would have a cog style belt that would basically bite into this and that and would give you better launch. That's kind of why they went into that. But again, if a machine is properly serviced and to AW's point, you've got proper belt tensioning on it until that belt starts to get glazed and ages in place and starts to wear, you're going to have real good launch as well. As long as you follow a basic principle, and I'll just kind of raise the camera a little bit. As long as you uh, follow a basic principle of never, ever launching with a Swedish beauty where I am right now. See where that take-up arm is way low? You always want to launch with a Swedish beauty or any machine for that matter where it's at the, the, the pinnacle of the high point for that take-up arm and it's almost on that downstroke. It's kind of right where it's about to go into that downstroke because then it frees up the mechanics of that machine with no binding, no resistance, and you get a real nice launch. And that not only saves you a lot of frustration with why is this thing making that humming sound that Scott demonstrated, but it won't go. It's because that take-up arm is creating binding because it's in a lower position instead of being at the pinnacle and it's ready to sweep down in that downstroke. Hopefully that makes sense and you can avoid a lot of frustration. Plus you can avoid the bird nesting that a lot of people experience when they try to launch at that lower take-up arm position. Okay. All right. I'm going to set these down and hopefully I, I didn't look at the chat, but hopefully that was a adequate answer. Oh, and I see Dr. Dr. T from Finland has joined us as well, which is great. Welcome Dr. T. And it looks like AW is from the Netherlands. Beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you can absolutely uh, you can ab absolutely fashion uh, a suitable motor mount, or you can supplement the one that you have that's been compromised and just build it up a little bit with oil resistant uh, gasket type maker material. And uh, you'll be able to keep that motor in a nice fixed position. Because probably what you're getting now is when you're trying to kick that motor in, because that motor mount over here has failed, uh, you're getting a flexing of that motor, which you definitely don't want. This should be in a fixed stationary position as that uh, pulley and motor engages and it should be riding without pitching in any way. So, yeah, brilliant. You guys are so smart. I, I, I'm guessing that AW from the Netherlands probably was already thinking that direction, but when we chat through it, we kind of confirm things, don't we? That's great. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Let's see, what do we got now? Okay, let me set all this stuff to the side. And if you missed the beginning of this live stream, you'll want to watch it afterwards or kind of rewind it uh, because I talk about what brought this machine to the workshop. I explained a little bit of the concept of capacitors, resistors, and that'll be real helpful to you to keep you sewing safe with your Swedish beauty if you have one. So, all right, give me just a second, you guys. All right, and I'm going to be a I'm going to be a sissy and turn my heater back on because, like I said, it is a lot colder here today than it has been. So, and also, if you join the live stream a little bit late, we just did this sew off on uh, this uh, saddle grade leather, and I talked about the fact that while the top stitch is okay, we could make it a lot better if we backed off the upper tension because right now that bobbin case is trying to pull down to give us a nice top stitch kind of like the lock stitch over here but it's uh it's struggling so what i did is i backed off the upper tension a little bit so that when we lay down this zigzag we hopefully will be able to get a nicer definition with it and i'm not going to go with a super wide zigzag the wider your zigzag is when you're getting needle swing the more tension you need to maintain a good 
uh, lock stitch like this one. So if you're ever sewing a, a real wide zigzag and you're struggling with getting that lock stitch to be defined, you've got to look at that upper tension to try to solve the problem for you. Because the, the more you, the, the wider spans you go in kind of letting that thread kind of just dangle out there and stretch, the harder that that upper tension needs to pull to maintain the integrity of that stitch. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so let's, let's go into a zigzag now. And hopefully I didn't do myself a disservice by backing off that upper tension because I'm, I'm going to go with probably about a three. I should show you that. Duh. So the lay of the land on this machine real quick, if you don't know these Swedish beauties, is you've got this bottom knob right here that's going to allow you, when you turn it clockwise, like so. When you turn it clockwise like that, you can all go all the way down to the 6 o'clock position. And what it'll do is it'll drop those feed dogs. I've got material underneath there right now, so I don't want to be messing around with that too much. Otherwise, when we first uh, step on that foot controller, those feed dogs might not be fully up. And we're going to get some wonky stuff going on. So I'm going to leave that at the 12 o'clock position, which means the feed dogs are fully engaged. When you turn it down to the 6 o'clock position clockwise, those feed dogs drop all the way. So you can do free motion quilting or freehand embroidery. This knob right here is going to give you control over stitch width. Right now we're set on zero. I think you can see that. I'm kind of looking over my shoulder. Uh, we're set on zero, which means we're going to get a straight stitch. As soon as we start to turn this knob in, you know, between one and four, we're going to get that width factor for those zigzag stitching or those decorative stitches as well. And when you're doing the cam functions of this machine, you generally, not always, but you generally want to have this stitch width all the way over on four and then manipulate the look of that stitch using your stitch length, which is up here. The other thing, and it's not used very often on these Swedish beauties, this little metal tab you can see sticking up right there is going to give you access to the automatic buttonhole that's a part of this machine feature. And it will allow you to, to basically um, start and stop the functions of that as you're completing a buttonhole. I don't use it a lot, and I'm not the greatest cheerleader for it, but that's what it does. And again, this is your stitch length up here. The Swedish beauties have a, a crazy range when it comes to stitch length. You can be all the way over on four like we are right now. Or you can take it all the way down. I mean, you could go all the way down to zero, but then you're not going to get any material feed at all. But anywhere from one, two, three, four, all the way up to 0.5. And generally, when you're doing the cam-generated stitches with these Swedish beauties, uh, you're going to be right around 0.5 or maybe a little bit below that would be the sweet spot for these Swedish beauties for cam-generated stitches. So again, if we were doing a cam-generated stitch, we would turn the stitch width right around 4. You could certainly go back a little bit if you want it to be more narrow. But generally on 4 and then your stitch length, you know, right around 0.5 or slightly below. Again, if you go too low on the stitch length, that material is going to barely be feeding. And especially if you don't have enough presser foot pressure, you're going to be creating a mess. So I, I generally go right around 0.4, between 0.4 to 0.5. And then this button in the middle is going to be for uh, reverse sewing. This particular model, the CL21A, does not have like some of the later green machines the 19e specials the 21 e's does not have a two-stage reverse so if we want to use the reverse feature on this we've got to hold it in and then when we're done done sewing in reverse we then release it back out again you can see that that's let me adjust that a little bit This actually, hold on a second. That's so funny. Hold on one second here. There we go. I had to wiggle the balance wheel. 
with the mechanics of this machine, sorry, I had to move the camera there. With the mechanics of this machine, as you're manipulating stitch length and stitch width, there we go, right about there, I think. As you're manipulating stitch width and stitch length, sometimes the mechanics, because you're basically, to get reverse, you're, when you push in reverse, you're basically manipulating that Pitman arm that runs vertically in the machine. And sometimes it'll bind a little bit. You can see it moves beautifully for reverse sewing. But for a second, as I was goofing around with these two, I created a little bit of a binding and I had to wiggle the balance wheel to free up that mechanism again to allow it to come back out. But again, you know, this reverse, it's not a big hassle. You hold it in when you're sewing a reverse and then you let it go. But the Swedish did make some modifications to this when they came out with the later models, late 1950s, early 1960s time frame, and they gave the reverse a, a two-stage. So if, if you got a 19E special and you, you pushed it in, kind of like I did a second ago, and it was binding a little bit, and it stuck in, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's messed up. It's goofed up. Why is it staying in like that? That's by design. Uh, the, the 19Es, uh, the 21Es, and a couple of other select models have a, a two-stage where when you push it in, it's going to go about 80% of the way in. It's going to stay, and then you're going to push it in a little bit further, and then it'll pop back out again. This machine doesn't have that, but that's okay. So now this control over here, this control over here, when you have the stitch width on zero, this control is going to allow you to control needle position. So if I come out a little bit, you can see the needle position changing. There we go. Okay, so this will give you control over needle position as long as you're set on zero. If, if you all of a sudden are trying to adjust your needle position and you have your stitch width control greater than zero, somewhere between one and four, adjusting that stitch width and telling that needle to swing, which is basically what it does when it goes between one and four, it's saying, okay, we're going to do a zigzag or we're going to do some sort of a stitch that requires needle swing. It's going to override this needle position control up here. It's going to override the needle position up here. So if we're on four and we say, okay, I want to, I want to mess around with needle position, watch what happens. Nothing. And I've gotten some people that have called me and they're panicking because needle position is really central to them. It's a big deal. They want to be able to launch with a left needle position or they want to be able to launch with a right needle position. And it's not responding. And they think, okay, something's broken on the machine. And I had one person that actually took the machine into a service center, like a sewing back, and they were ready to charge this person like $300 to supposedly fix the needle position issue on that Swedish beauty. Because when I, when I turn this, nothing's happening. And I said, well, where's your stitch width right now? Where's your stitch width set? And they said, I think they said it was on three. I said, take your stitch width and bring it all the way down to zero. Now try your needle position. <laughs> see that needless to say that customer never went back to that sewing back again and not necessarily because the sewing back people were trying to be deceptive although i suspect they were but because they didn't have the knowledge the simple knowledge of knowing that the needle position on these swedish beauties is only going to work when you're set to do a straight stitch not when you're set to do something that requires needle swing OK, so again, the power of the classroom is we learn together. Some of you or others that watch this live stream later on are not going to know that and they can avoid an expensive service call 
by going to a sewing back or a certain, you know, a sewing center or something like that and pay someone to fix what already is engineered to do what it's doing in the machine. Because again, as soon as you tell it, Hey, we want needle swing, that cam in the back of the machine is going to override your desire to set needle position. It's going to decide where that needle is going to go. When you're set on a straight stitch, you can decide where that needle is going to start left position, right position, or center position. The other thing I'll tell you real quick, and I sometimes forget to mention it, is when you're operating with one of these green machines that have this style of cam control right here, you can kind of see the numbers from five to one. Whenever you have one of these green machines that has that cam function where this little slider goes in and out to choose what cam you're going to generate, what cam stitch you're going to generate, you need to know a couple of things. One is if you're going to be using the cam functions on this machine, you have to have one of these. Hold on a sec. You have to have one of these in the back. And the reason you have to have one of these in the back is because this is going to set the swing boundaries of that needle. It's going to set the swing boundaries of that needle. That's what this cam does. There's a little reader finger that goes over these bumps like Braille. Like Braille, it, that little finger reads over these bumps. And based on what it reads, it decides what stitch you're wanting to generate based on what you've set here, okay? But the other thing that this cam is going to do when you slide it over that mounting shaft is it's going to push that reader finger out just a little bit when it's not actuated. Basically, the way you, you turn that cam function on and off to some degree so that reader finger can read, that, read this cam is as soon as you go zero on the stitch width, it's going to pull that finger away from this cam. As soon as you go to zero and you turn this stitch width to zero, there's a little reader finger that is on the, the, the technically it's on the right side of the cam as it's inserted like this. It's going to pull that finger away and hold it out like this. As soon as you turn this somewhere between one and four, the stitch width, it's going to allow that finger to go into that cam to read these bumps as it's turning like this, okay? So the big deal is never operate a green machine without a cam in the back if you're gonna be using anything that requires uh, needle swing. Anything that requires needle swing because without a cam in there, it's gonna allow that finger to pitch in further, and it's gonna allow that needle to go outside of its boundaries. And that may well have happened for this machine because there's a lot of scarring on the throat plate. And I showed that, I'll, I showed that to you guys in the Facebook post uh, of uh, my restorative effort to try to make this existing throat plate cover safe again. A lot of scarring. And the issue when a needle hits the throat plate as it's passing through, is that needle creates scarring to that throat plate opening. And as the thread is trying to feed out of the bobbin case and complete its sewing process, that thread can catch on that, the, that rough metal from the needle hitting it. And it can create issues with the thread breaking. It can create issues with the thread not feeding properly. So, and oftentimes that's an accidental thing. It's an accidental thing because someone tries to operate one of these machines, doesn't understand that you've got to have one of these in the back if you're going to be using anything that requires needle swing. And they'll kick on that foot controller and that needle will strike that throat plate. And sometimes they'll do it multiple times. You know, it goes back to the old saying, don't do the same thing and expect a different outcome. But they'll do it anyway because maybe they think their needle is bent. And then they'll end up hitting that throat plate opening multiple times and creating some major scarring issues uh, to that throat plate. So have one of these in the back if you're going to be using uh, the cam functions 
of the Swedish beauty. Okay. I know I kind of went over that multiple times, but it's really an important point and it could cause, it could, it could save you a lot of headache. Okay. All right. So we're going to be doing a zigzag now after all that blah, blah, blah. We're already set on four. I'm probably going to do one that's not quite as wide. I'm going to go probably between, what do we say, two and a half. Let's do two and a half. And then we'll match the stitch length. We'll match the stitch length with two and a half as well. I usually try to balance the two, you know, to some extent. So I've adjusted my stitch length to two and a half. I've got my stitch width on two and a half. And again, whenever you're controlling knobs like this, you're adjusting them, you're turning them, always make sure your needle is free of the material because as you make adjustments over here, it's going to cause that needle to move a wee bit. You can see as I'm adjusting this stitch width controller, look what's happening to the needle. And you can imagine if that's stuck down in this leather, it could very easily bend this needle, right? So two and a half, two and a half. And now let's go over to the machine and we'll actually stitch down and do a zigzag with this machine. And again, this is, if you're just joining the live stream, this is uh, saddle grade leather. They make uh, gun holsters out of this stuff. And again, depending on where you cut from the hide and how you fashion this when you, when you uh, process the leather, it can be thicker or thinner. So the stuff they use for gun holsters and other applications like that that are a lot more heavy duty are going to be a thicker version of this. This is about three to four ounces. Okay, so I'm going to make sure my take-up arm is at the highest position. We're on that downstroke. And now we're going to kick in and do a two by, uh, a, excuse me, a two and a half by two and a half uh, zigzag. Okay, all right, here we go. All right, let me raise that presser foot. Oh, and I can see, I can see something very interesting. Remember I adjusted back? I adjusted back that upper tension, right? Because I thought we don't want to, we don't want to steal away from that straight stitch. This one's a little bit weaker. And here I was concerned about, okay, I'm not going to have a clearly enough defined zigzag. But I did the wrong thing in this instance, because you'll notice as soon as I turn it over, guess what? We don't have enough upper tension to complete that zigzag lock stitch properly. Look at what happened, because I backed off that upper tension. See that? We don't have enough upper tension, so it could not complete the zigzag, plus we got a little funky thing going on over here. Fix that over there. So if you ever get a situation like this where, okay, you're trying to compensate and, okay, I'm going to be really smart and I'm going to back off my upper tension so that I can get a nicely defined uh, top stitch but not take away from the lock stitch too much, I did in this instance. So now we need to sew it again and I need to bump that upper tension back up to where it was. So we can hopefully correct this issue. Let me clip these threads and we'll see if we can do that. Oops. Yeah, like this. That's the correct way to orientate it. There we go. All right. So we're going to try this again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust that upper tension back up to where it was and see if that corrects our issue as far as giving us a, a lock stitch on this zigzag that is proper. Yep, that's correct. Okay. All right, let's try this again. Here we go. Take up arms all the way up. Yep, here we go. And you have to be careful about not, not adjusting the upper tension too high either because then you'll have issues with the thread breaking also.
And I did off camera a little bit. I thought, well, maybe, maybe if I make it a little bit less wide, that will also help overcome that issue. And that's what I did. But watch the impact that we brought, even with that, from one to the other. So this one again, as we sewed it, this top row. Oh, that, that one I think I'd done off camera, actually. Did I? Oh, like this. Duh. <laughs> so we did the straight stitch, a little bit weak on the top stitch. So we backed off the upper tension. Then we sewed this zigzag at a 2.5 2 by 2.5 setting. And I backed off that upper tension thinking, I, I want to keep a nice top stitch. I don't want to have an overly poppy lock stitch. But the result we got was this, where it wasn't even enough upper tension with that needle swing. Again, when you stretch that thread out and you're doing needle swing, you need to bump up. And I said that earlier in this live stream, you need to bump up that top stitch so it's pulling up harder as you're stretching that thread with that needle swing going back and forth. And... I didn't do that. And then I just adjusted it a little bit, bumped up that upper tension again, and look at what it did on this lower row compared to that middle row. It's night and day, and I only bumped it up from about five and a half to a little bit below six and a half, less than one, uh, one uh, less than a one point factor. And we went from getting this where the lock stitch was incomplete to this where we've got a nicely defined lock stitch here at about a two by two factor. And we also have good definition on this bottom row for the top stitch as well. So sometimes we can try to be anticipatory about the tension factors as we're changing stitch patterns, as we're changing material as well. And sometimes it can shoot us in the foot. It certainly did here. You know, we sewed that that one right in the middle. And we had a major issue because I had backed off that upper tension too much. And then we made a little bit of an adjustment and brought it back into form again. Yeah. So a good lesson, even though I goofed up, it was a, something that we can learn from in this classroom, which is the whole point of the classroom, right? So I'm going to throw that to the back, our single layer of uh, of uh, saddle grade leather and we'll launch into our next sew off. Oh, very cool. AW did a little bit of uh, extra credit for the classroom. And he said, when we're on four, we're getting the result of about seven stitches per inch seven stitches per inch and and that varies depending on the material you're using also it varies as well based on where you have the presser foot pressure in here set as well because the presser foot pressure is going to control the feed the press down of that that presser foot bar against that material going over the feed dogs and if you're sewing a heavier material you increase this by pushing it to the rear if you're sewing a lighter material, you bring this dial to the front and you decrease the presser foot pressure so that it, it it's not pressing down as hard. Presser foot pressure can have a huge impact also on how many stitches per inch you're going to get, depending on what you're sewing. All right, give me a second here. Okay, let's do some more sewing. And I think we're going to launch a little bit into the decorative stitching. And we'll do a little bit of protect full grain leather with that. And again, I'm changing, I'm changing material types again because saddle grade leather has a different uh, consistency and density to it than protected full grain leather. You can see if you look at these two side by side, they're gonna be close in thickness, but the protected full grain leather is gonna be just a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker than this saddle grade leather. Wait, let me adjust the camera. Then you can see actually what I'm pointing at. 
So if you look these two side by side, you can see that the protected full grain leather, the blue stuff on the bottom, is just a tiny little bit thicker than the saddle grade leather. They're real close. They're real, real close. But it's just going to be a little bit thicker. And again, it depends on where they cut this leather from the hide uh, that will determine. And sometimes even with a single piece like this, the thickness of that leather is going to vary a little bit as you're going across it sewing from where you start to where you end. So we've got our tension set in a certain way right now where we got a good result with a between a 2 to a 2.5 by 2.5 zigzag stitch. Now we're going to be sewing decorative stitching from the cam output on this machine. And I think right now in the back of the machine we have cam A. Let me double check. What do we have? Actually, we have cam B in the back right now, I think, unless the customer sent me duplicate cams. Let me check. Nope, we've got uh, we've got cam B in the back right now, and it's actually a revised cam B. And the way you can tell if you happen to have a cam, I'll just show this to you real quick because it's good to know. If you have a cam like this, where if you look real close, you'll see that it has an A and then what looks like a little mark after it that looks almost like an I. Let me turn my light on again see if that helps. You see that? It's like an AI. That's telling you that this is a revised cam. In other words, there was an original cam A, and then they may have developed new stitch patterns that they wanted to engineer into another cam. And instead of making it another cam A alone, because then you're like, well, these cams A's are, cam A's are not the same. They came out with an A revised version. That's what that little I after the A means. You'll see the same thing on the other lettered cams as well. And actually in the back of the machine right now is a revised B cam. So if you ever, if you have a Swedish beauty and you always thought, well, why do Maybe you have a duplicate A cam. And what is, why do I have an A cam and then I have an AI cam? What is that about? That simply means that they developed new uh, stitch patterns and they came out with a revised cam A so they could offer different stitches to their customers. So if, if someone ever told you, well, you don't need both of those cam A's, they're, they're the same, they probably are not because it's a revised version of the original offering different stitch options. Okay. Just wanted to explain that real quick. So again, we'll give us a try and see what we think. And again, if I didn't mention it already, I don't think I did. If I didn't mention it already, on this little slider, again, you've got choices of five to one. In position five, always, 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 in position five, always is going to be zigzag. And then the cam decorative type stitches are going to be between four and one. So on every cam like this, you've got a zigzag that is engineered into the cam that also defines the stitch boundaries. Remember me talking about you don't want to operate this machine without a cam because one of these uh, bumps, these little braille bumps, is telling that machine do a zigzag and don't don't swing that needle beyond this boundary that's why this cam being in the machine is absolutely critical because it'll keep you from having a needle strike on the throat plate and causing scarring to that throat plate opening so it defines that and it always always in position five gives us a zigzag so realize that as you're using the machine you're really, if you count like uh, this customer, Patty Landers from Texas, might say to someone, well, I've got three cams and there's five stitches on each cam. So I have 15 decorative stitches. Is that accurate? Is that correct? What do you guys think? Type in the chat. If, if Patty has the cam that's in the back of the machine, which is a revised B cam, and then she's got a C cam, 
and she has a revised ACAM. How many decorative stitches that are CAM generated does she have in all? How many total? Because she has two here, two CAMs, and then a CAM in the back of the machine. How many decorative stitches does she actually have? Did you guys fall asleep? Hey, you're still in class. <laughs> I don't think Emma meant 113. I hope she didn't. <laughs> so Emma is saying we have a total of 13. Anyone else that's in the live stream right now, do you agree with Emma? Again, on every one of these cams, position five is going to be a zigzag straight away. And it's a zigzag on the cam because the, the zigzag cam braille indentation on this cam is also going to set the swing boundaries of the needle so that it doesn't go too wide and hit that uh, throat plate. So we know we've got a zigzag that's already in the equation here. And we've got three cams. So how many decorative stitches do we actually have? Well, you know what? AW, AW is not wrong. And I've mentioned this in uh, videos before, where when you manipulate, when you manipulate the stitch width and the stitch length, you can take a decorative stitch and give it a totally different look, can't you? You can give it a totally different look. But the point I'm trying to lead us towards is if you look at these two cams and you go, okay, there's going to be a zigzag on each of these cams that's going to take up one of these positions. So we kind of lose position five because it's going to be a zigzag automatically. And then we're left with one through four. So we basically on each cam, we have four decorative stitches. We have four decorative stitches, and if we have three cams, four times three gives us 12. So if you look at bare bones, we've got 12 decorative stitches, and then on each of these cams in one of those positions, we've got a zigzag. So we've got a zigzag and four decorative stitches on each cam, giving us a total of 12 decorative stitches between three cams, A, B, C. If we had all of the cams, if we had cam D and we had cam E as well, then we would have five and we could take it times the four factor and we would have 20 decorative stitches that we could potentially generate if we had cams A, B, C, D, E, right? Five cams times four gives us 12 or gives us, gives us 20, 20 decorative stitches. But I agree with AW. I agree with AW when we when we when we manipulate stitch length and we manipulate stitch width to some degree, we can create and recreate those decorative stitches to give us a lot more than the bare bones of the 12 that we'll get right now when we look at three cams times four. Because again, the five is going to be a zigzag straight away. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not sure where AW is getting 13, but how, how are you getting 13, AW? Because you're going to have one through four. It's going to give us four decorative stitches on each of these cams, unless you count the zigzag. If the zigzag can be manipulated and modified to a point where maybe it looks like a mending stitch, then I guess we could argue that even the zigzag could be a type of decorative utility stitch, couldn't it? Maybe that's what AW means. But otherwise, by design, by the bumps on this, you're going to get basically four stitch patterns that are considered ornamental or decorative. The other stitch pattern on here is going to be that zigzag that we can use for utility purposes and also to set the swing boundaries for the cam uh, output on the machine as well. Yeah, and Emma's, Emma's in the same camp where she's saying 
the zigzag could also be considered a decorative stitch. I don't disagree with that, but most people, most people, most people, most people will consider a zigzag to be more of a utility than a decorative type stitch. And that's where they, most people that are, are calculating, well, how many decorative stitches do I have on a cam are going to exclude the zigzag because in, in many camps, it's considered a utility stitch. The other four stitches that are engineered into this cam through these bumps are going to be considered ornamental or decorative stitches. So most camps, and it doesn't mean that they're right. It's just their point of view. Most camps are going to say we've got four decorative ornamental stitches and we have one utility stitch, which is that zigzag that also with this cam is going to set the swing boundaries so that we're not scarring our throat plate. So I, I think I think we can agree to disagree agreeably and say a zigzag could have an ornamental look depending on what we do to the stitch length and the stitch width. Yeah, why not? I agree. Cool. All right. Cleaning my glasses a little quick and looking at the chat. <coughs> Yeah, A AW in the from the Netherlands. AW from the Netherlands is looking at totality of stitching. Totality of stitching. When you look at the um, the cams and you say, okay, we have we have four times three. We've got twelve decorative stitches. Plus we have the zigzag that gives us thirteen. Plus we have the straight stitch that gives us fourteen. So if you look at totality of the stitching on one of these green machines, you can say we've got a base of 14 stitch pattern options. We've got a straight stitch, we've got a zigzag, and then on each of the cams, we have four decorative or or ornamental type stitches. So it's basically 12 plus the zigzag is 13 plus the straight stitch is 14. So I think that's, that's absolutely accurate. That's absolutely spot on. The 21E, the 21E does not have a three-point zigzag, but when you move into the Color Matic series, going all the way back to the inception of the Color Matic series with the Model 2000 that came out in 1960, uh, and certainly later models, you do have the benefit of that three-point zigzag that I've demonstrated on this channel multiple times. So... Unfortunately, within the green series, starting with the class 20s, going into the class 21s, you don't necessarily have the benefit of that three-point zigzag unless you get into some of the 19E specials. Some of the 19E special series do offer a three-point zigzag style stitch. So I shouldn't say none of the green machines, but until you get into the late 1950s, early 1960s, and they produce the 19E special, uh, that machine, depending on when it came out, may be able to offer a three-point zigzag. But certainly the Colormatic series uh, introduced that as a staple as far as stitch pattern options, and certainly later machines as well. Oh, Hey, welcome to Doreen and Kevin from the great state of Iowa. Welcome, you guys. Let me let me get into this while you guys visit, interact with each other. I don't know how many leaders we have present, but if Emma wants to give Doreen and uh, Kevin a late pass, that would be great. And let's jump into some of these stitches that we want to do now. All right, hold on a second. The other thing I should show you real quick, and I know I'm bouncing all, all over the place and covering a lot of stuff. But the other thing I should point out real quick is when we're operating with the cam, and right now we've got a revised cam B in the back of the machine, when we're wanting to use one of those cam features, we need to remember that we have to calibrate the machine because, again, I talked about that little reader finger that's on the right side of the cam when it's inserted in the machine like this.
that little reader finger is either pressed into the cam or it retracts, presses in or retracts. When you're changing out cams, when you're changing out cams, you always want to make sure that you have this slider in position five so that that cam stack is fully extended to the rear. You also want to make sure that you have the stitch width on zero so that it pulls that finger back. So as you're trying to pull that cam out, that finger isn't jamming into the cam and you're you're fighting it and you're pulling on that cam and you could potentially bend that finger that reads these cam bumps. And all of a sudden you're, you're going to get gibberish from the machine because that that cam finger will not be calibrated to read these bumps properly. So my point is again, when you're when you're trying to take one of these cams in and out, let's say, well, I don't want to, I don't want B revised anymore. I want to try A revised. So extend this this slider all the way to position five, which we know is our zigzag, but it also extends that cam stack all the way to the rear. And then you have to bring a little lever down, pull the cam out. And you always do that with it on zero so that that finger, uh, again, is retracted. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the other thing that I was getting to is in relation to changing from one cam setting to another. As we're changing from one cam setting to another, you also want to make sure that you're zeroing out, as I call it, the stitch width. That'll pull that finger back and allow that cam stack to slide freely. So right now we're on zero. We should be able to slide this into position four like I just did very easily. And then we take our stitch width and we bring it back to four again. So we're ready to sew. Obviously, we have to make an adjustment on our stitch length also. Right now we're at about two and a half. We want to take it down again. When you're sewing decorative, ornamental type stitches with these Swedish beauties, you want to be at 0.5 or maybe 0.4 to 0.5 right in this range right here for decorative ornamental stitching. Hopefully you can see that. I don't know if the, if the camera's being good or bad right now. Okay, so that's our stitch length setting right there that we wanted to, to set. And then let's say we just sewed pattern number four. Let's say we did. Before we try moving this slider again, because right now that finger is pressed in. Right now that finger is pressed into the cam. It's pressed in. We want that finger to retract before we try moving this slider. So we take our stitch width down to zero to retract that little finger that reads these cams. And then we should be able to move this into position three, which is what I just did. My glasses are so dirty. I think we're in position three. Yeah, we are. And then we have to remember to move our stitch width back to four or somewhere in that range again so that when we start sewing, we don't get a straight stitch. That's very, very tiny. <laughs> so, and that's happened to me before. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to move us actually all the way out to our furthest point. Uh, so I have to turn stitch width back again to zero to retract that finger. I'm going to move us all the way out to one. Right about there, I think. And this is this can get a little bit stiff sometimes. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to continue to, before I ship this out, I'm going to continue to treat this with lubrication and heat, cleaning off the old uh, gunk and rust, because there's basically a shaft that goes from the front of here to the rear of the machine that slides that cam, if you can imagine, slides that cam forward or back, so that as the finger reads it, it's going to read the appropriate bump on the cam. And this gets stiff over time. There's sometimes a combination of varnishing, old oil, and even rust that builds up on that rod. So it's a lot looser, a lot more free moving than it was when the machine arrived at the workshop. But it still is a little bit on the stiff side, which I have to kind of warn uh, Patty about uh, because 
as the machine is shipped, it'll it'll tend to stiffen up a little bit more again. So I'll try to get it as loose and free moving as possible. But right now we're set on position one. We're going to give that stitch a try. And again, we're sewing with the revised B cam is what we're using. Revised B cam. And I've already set uh, my stitch length is good to go, but I need to remember to move this back. And again, make sure your needle is free of the material before you move any of these knobs because it's going to sometimes impact movement on the needle and you don't want to bend your needle. Yeah. Okay, so let's get over here. And again, if you're joining the live stream a little bit late, we're sewing with protected full grain leather. Our setup is, and I didn't even cover this yet, and we're all the, all the way into this live stream now, an hour and 40 minutes, goodness gravy, an hour and 40 minutes. I know pa time passes quick when we're, when we're together. It's not like the old classroom when you were in school and you're like, oh, you keep looking at the clock. We have so much fun. We cover so much stuff. We learn so much stuff. Time passes very quick. But what we're going to sew now is using a size 9014 needle, which is a universal needle. We're sewing leather with a universal needle. And again, if you don't know a thing about needles, Needles are designed for different material types based on their point, based on their scarf, their shaft, their long groove, their short groove, and everything else. There's very smart people, a lot smarter than me, that work in needle factories and are designers of needles that analyze materials, whether it's protected full grain leather like this or saddle grade leather or anything else, and they come up with the best design for that needle based on the point, the shaft, the scarf, the long groove, the short groove, the blah, 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 the blah, blah, blah. And they come up with the ideal needle for that type of material. Universal needles are engineered in a way that they're supposed to be able to cover a wide scope of materials. So with a universal needle like this 9014, we should be able to sew anything from leather to cotton to canvas to vinyl to bubble gum material. And the list goes on of different materials we should be able to sew with this. So I could have just as easily, since during this live stream today, we're really focusing on leather. I just decided to do that. We could have just gone with a straight leather needle. And then it would have given us a point that has a cutting edge to it that would have gone through this leather even easier than more of a, uh, a plain point that's going to be sharp, but it's not going to have a cutting edge to it. It's not going to almost be serrated to cut through that leather nice and easy so our setup is not absolutely ideal but that's okay because after all of the work on this swedish beauty i think we're ready to get the job done and our thread today is a standard coats and clark dual duty thread that i bought at joanne fabrics dual duty is going to give us a little bit more versatility in what we can sew with it some people even quilt with dual duty thread so hopefully we get some good results as we do this Stitch number one on revised cam B. And I will sew this without any uh, music. Uh, but eventually, you guys know me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up pulling some music out because it's me. It's what I do. It's how I roll. Okay. All right. Let's give this a go. Let me get my take-up arm at the highest position. And we'll see what stitch one looks like. We'll see what stitch one looks like on uh, cam B revised can be revised. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make a quick adjustment. My upper tension is at about six and a half. I'm concerned that that might be, let me take a look. Let me take a preview here. Yeah, that is pulling a little bit too tight. Again, if your upper tension is pulling up too hard, it's going to compress or it's going to uh, it's going to basically condense the size of that stitch on the bottom and be pulling it up too hard. So I'm going to back it off just a hair, just a little bit. All right, here we go. Oh, I did not sew straight at all. My line is like, Caddy Wampus, his dad would have said. Not very straight at all. Goodness gravy. 
So this is interesting because our friend A.W. had asked about a three-point zigzag. Does the 21E have it is what he had asked. He or she, I should say. I, I shouldn't assume that A.W. is a man or a woman. Uh, this decorative stitch on the revised Cam B, and maybe it's because somebody was fussing and said, hold on a second. Why does the 2000 Colormatic machine, why does that have a three-point zigzag and these classic green machines don't offer that? Why don't, why don't they offer it? And, he, and that individual may have been a very loud voice for the Husqvarna people. So when they came out with this revised version of Cam B, they came out with a stitch that almost, not quite, almost resembles the three-point zigzag. It's kind of close when you look at it, isn't it? It's kind of close. It's a good-looking stitch, and it almost resembles that three-point zigzag, doesn't it? Yeah, sort of. Let's take a look at that lock stitch. Let's see if let's see if our balance and our choice for this protected full grain leather nailed it. So we got a lot of needle swing going on. We've got our stitch width set at four. When I made that adjustment before, when we we're going to do a standard zigzag, we had some wonky stuff. Remember where it didn't even complete that lock stitch on the back. It was just kind of hanging there saying, help, help, help. Now we just did an ornamental type stitch in position one on the cam stack. And we've got beautiful balance. We started a little bit too snug. And I kind of backed off that upper tension a little bit so we would still have a very nicely defined lock stitch, but not overly poppy. See if I can get a little bit closer and kind of show it to you. Hold on. Assuming the camera cooperates. So it's a little bit hard to see with this protected full grain leather because of the nap factor, but we've got a really, really good looking lock stitch. And I could demonstrate it better by kind of pulling it back a little bit, showing it to you like that. Very good balance and a lot of needle swing again with this. And again, we didn't do a ridiculously light sew off. Look at it from the side. That's probably about four to five ounces of protected full grain leather. That's thicker than most leather coats will be. That's thicker than most leather coats. Unless you're talking about like a bomber jacket or something like that. But we sewed through a lot of leather. Again, we're not using a leather needle. And uh, it did a beautiful job with this stitch number one on this revised cam B. So beautiful stitching. Lovely, lovely, lovely. I like it a lot. Really cool. Really pretty. And you could do a lot of things with a stitch like this. Yeah, yeah, you could. So I'm going to recalibrate the machine again, taking that stitch width down to zero and get ready to move us into position two on the cam stack. We'll see what kind of stitch that gets us. So all I did was, again, when you're changing between the cam settings on here, you want to take your stitch width down to zero so that it pulls that finger back away from the cam. And then you move your slider into the next position you want, which we, I just did it. We're going to be doing stitch number two now on revised cam B. Kind of looking over my shoulder. I can't see if you're seeing that or not. Let me take my hand off the camera. Almost. There we go. There we go. So you can see I'm in position two now, which is going to give us stitch pattern number two on revised cam B. But I've got to remember before I start stitching again, I've got to remember to adjust my stitch length back to four. Otherwise, when we start sewing, all we're going to get is a very short straight stitch if this is set on zero. So there you go. All right, let me get my material back into position again. 
And hopefully I sew a little bit straighter this time. I didn't do so great that last time. I was like going on an angle. I didn't know what I was thinking. It's kind of weird. So the first thing I notice is I'm not ready. I'm not ready to sew because of what? What do you see in the shot? I'm not ready to sew. Why? Why am I not ready to sew? Or why am I not ready to launch, I should say? Dr. T, you're calling yourself a dinosaur, and I think you work in the tech field, don't you? I think Dr. T somehow has, has tech connections or works in the uh, on the technical side of something or other. He shared it with us. And again, Dr. T is the one that right now is... Uh, let's see. Oh, there's actually a picture of Dr. T now. Uh, but Dr. T is like the... Uh, you guys know who Dr. T is. He's from Finland, and I think he works in the technical space. So he's he's not a dinosaur. He is not a dinosaur. The rest of us might be, but not him. Okay. So let's do this next stitch now. I think we're all set, except for something to do in here. What's going on? So Bry guy, Bry guy is saying something about the needle coming onto the thread or something like that. That's not necessarily my concern unless sometimes if you launch in your tails back here, your tails back here are not long enough as you launch and that needle shaft starts to pull that thread. So it'll pull these threads in a little bit, almost like it's eating them. And sometimes that thread will get sucked in. So you want to have your tails on the back of here about three inches they could be a little bit longer than that three to four inches something like that and then when you launch with certain machines not necessarily a swedish beauty that has a rotary hook system but a lot of the oscillating hook systems when you're launching especially the japanese made ones you want to hold on to these threads as well because it'll prevent uh, a little bit of a bird nesting launching point at the beginning of that stitch line on the back so you kind of hold on to them a little bit and you feel that thread do its first one or two stitches. Then you can let go of it straight away. Yeah, Emma, Emma got it. I don't know if someone got it before Emma, but Emma noticed that right now our take up arm, right now our take up arm is at the lowest position, which means right now the mechanics of the machine are in a sewing mode of motion, of inertia, of energy, and it's flowing through that sequence. But when you're initially launching, you want to have that take-up arm all the way at the highest position, ready to downstroke. Look at that take-up arm closely. See how it's ready to downstroke? You can't. Let me raise it a little bit higher. Sorry. That take-up arm is ready to downstroke. Still don't have it high enough. Hold on. <laughs> now it's ready to downstroke. See that? See how it's starting to come down? That is the perfect place to launch for any sewing machine. Well, with the exception of if you go way back to the chain stitching machines, way back to the chain stitching machines, like the one that I've been working on for a long time from California. Some of the, the chain stitching machines, because of their mechanical design and the way they execute that chain stitch versus a lock stitch like this, some of the chain stitching machines can be the opposite. I have to say that. I got to say that. I got to do it. So for 99.9% .9 of the lock stitch machines like this Husqvarna, the highest position for the take-up arm is going to serve you best, especially if it's starting to go into that downstroke. For some chain stitching machines, even like this old Singer Model 20 in the back over here, the black one, just behind our Swiss gal and in front of uh, Uma, Umi and her buddy, that Model 20 you can kind of catch a little glimpse of back there. 
for some of those sti chain stitching machines, you actually launch better if your take-up arm is at the lowest position. I'll demonstrate that when I do a premiere for one of those machines. That way you know and, you, and you're familiar with that. But Emma was absolutely correct. We want to have that take-up arm at the highest position, and then we're ready to launch. So let's do that. Let's launch. All right. So again, we're doing stitch number three three no i'm sorry we're doing stitch number two on revised cam b revised cam b all right let, let's give it a go let's give this a go all right here we go I gotta watch my thread. I did so much sewing off camera. There we go. We made it to the end. Hey, what in heaven's name did we sew? What did we make? What do we do? What do we do? That's a fun one, isn't it? What would you guys call this stitch pattern? This again is stitch number two on revised cam B. What is that stitch pattern? Kind of look at it like this. We can see it even better, I think. What would you guys call that thing? I know what I'd call it, but it's not the correct name, I'm sure. And to, to A.W.'s point, our friend from the Philippines, wait, did I get that? No, Netherlands, I apologize. Uh, A.W. from the Netherlands, I apologize, I didn't mean to say Philippines, uh, but from the Netherlands, uh, that A.W. said, we have, limited, we have limitless stitch patterns, and you guys have heard me say that before in premieres, haven't you? You've heard me say that numerous times. Because as we manipulate the stitch length and the stitch width, we can get just a huge field of stitch variations of that stitch pattern. So here we did, uh, again, the stitch length I chose is right around 0.4. We could even go shorter than this and tighten this pattern up even more. Make it even a little bit more compact to give it uh, even more uh, stitch definition <clears throat> this is what i chose to do patty landers might sew this same pattern and she might say i'm a rebel i'm going to go shorter than 0.4 i'm going to do 0.2 or 0.3 it'll change the look of this stitch won't it so i'll just kind of move it past the camera very beautiful stitching <clears throat> and on the back we've got a, a real good looking lock stitch as well so we've got a good a real good balance right now for that uh, tension factor on this protected full grain leather. Beautiful stitching. And going shorter, I think, would be the, th the, the right thing to do giving it a little bit more stitch definition, compacting that stitching a little bit more. Is there a lock stitch? You can kind of catch a glimpse of it through the, the nap of that uh, protected full grain leather if I get real close. That nap does kind of swallow it up a little bit though, doesn't it? So if, if lock stitch were a major factor to you, if lock stitch were a major factor to you, and again, look at it from the side. That's the kind of leather we're going through. But my point is, if, if lock stitch was a major feature factor for you on the product or the project you're working on, 
you could certainly go with a heavier thread than Coates and Clark dual duty thread like we're using right now. Because dual duty thread is going to be around a 40 weight, but you could certainly step it up to a different, or you could alternate the color a little bit. The white is not popping through. You could certainly change the color of the thread as well, couldn't you? And if we were doing this all day long, we would go to a leather needle because the leather needle is going to make that cut through the leather with that serrated point much better than our, our universal needle is doing right now. And when you make a better cut, it's going to make that thread pop that much nicer because it's not going to be constrained by the surface of that material or by the nap factor as much when you make a nice hole with that serrated leather type needle edge that goes through the leather point. So, and again, I, I don't always go, I intentionally don't go with the ideal setup because I'm wanting to challenge that machine more. These are sewing Olympics. This is a, a, a major live stream premiere to feature uh, Patty Lander's machine from the great state of Texas. We're not going to make it easy for this Swedish beauty. We're not going to make it easy. We're just not going to do it. So, looking to see if there's any comments I need to respond to. Hold on a sec. Take up arm, highest position. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Emma. I, I, I kind of see it as a snaky type pattern as well. Absolutely. Okay. So, and don't be afraid, kind of like I think Emma was saying, and I know that uh, Paula and Bill and uh, Sonny as well would all echo the same thing. Our classroom here is not where, number one, I, I'm, not, I'm not a know-it-all. There are things that I discover new in the workshop every day. And I certainly discovered some new things as I was taking this machine through triage after the capacitor exploded in the back of it and caused damage to a number of motor components and other things. I learned a lot through that process. And I described that by saying, sometimes the teacher always, uh, anyone that's in this uh, classroom regularly knows how that, that, that statement finishes. Sometimes a teacher always a what? Always a what? Yeah, Caterpillar too describes it well. I think so, Emma. Yeah, for sure. So sometimes a teacher always a what? Yeah, and if anyone wants to echo what echo what uh, Emma wrote, always a student. And that's why you can step out of the shadows into the live chat and post answers. And sometimes you'll nail it. Sometimes you'll, you'll miss it. But that's all part of being a student. We're always learning. We're continuously learning in this classroom together. It's not like I'm, I'm a savant. You know, I'm some sort of a magic savant and I have all the answers. And all you have to do is listen and take good notes. And then you'll become smart too. That's, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, I share the knowledge that I have. Many of you will jump in and share your knowledge, and it makes us that much better. It makes us that much smarter as, as students and fellow teachers. We're all fellow teachers. So never forget that. Never second-guess yourself and go, ah, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to goof up and, you know, and, and get the wrong answer. Well, who cares? Getting the wrong answer is kind of like uh, uh, Edison trying to make a light bulb. Someone questioned him one, some, one time. You guys know this story. You guys are super smart. Someone questioned Edison one time and said, geez, what have you, you know, what do you think of all your failures? You, you had like almost a thousand failures, a th almost a thousand failures before you finally figured out how to make a light bulb. Does anyone remember what Edison said about that? What did he say about that? He had almost a thousand failures before he finally figured out how to make a proper light bulb. Does anyone, anyone remember what he said? Yeah, exactly right. Kevin and Doreen, always, always, always a student. We're always learning together and we're learning from each other. 
Well, what Edison said, because no one has typed it in yet. Wait, hold on a second. Oh, okay. You know what? I, I get it, Dr. T. Dr. T is just wrote a statement. He goes, I'm not a dinosaur because of my lack of uh, technical skills. Uh, it's because of some of the choices and preferences that I have. Old fountain pens, et cetera, et cetera. You can read what he wrote. But what Edison said, and I thought it was really cool. He said, those 900 plus times that I was trying to make a light bulb were not failures. They showed me how not to make a light bulb. They were the discovery path. They were the journey of trying things and discovering that they didn't work, but they still taught me lessons. They guided me eventually towards making a light bulb. So when we have failures in life, they should be celebrated because generally they're going to lead us on a path to where we want to be anyway. They're going to show us what doesn't work so we can discover what does work. Does that make sense? I think it does. Hopefully it does. Okay, so we did stitch number two. That's this. We did stitch number one. Now I'm going to set the machine up for stitch number three on revised cam B. So I take the stitch width. You saw the needle move. See that? I took the stitch width down to zero so that it pulls that finger back. And now I'm going to go towards stitch number three. There we go. Now I'm going to take my stitch width back to four. And now we're going to launch into stitch number three on cam uh, on B cam revised, revised B cam, however you want to say it. Okay. So here goes stitch number three on revised cam B. Yeah, that worked better that time. <laughs> here we go. Do I have it lined up correctly? Yes, I do. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. Here we go. And I'm just going to take away from this real quick and show you that take-up spring. Look at that take-up take spring working. And that's why the Swedish... Let me, let me focus on what I'm doing here. That's why the Swedish came up with... You saw that take-up spring. Hopefully you could see that in the shot. The take-up spring along with the take-up arm, was just going back and forth very rapidly. And when the take-up spring gets pulled up by the action of the take-up arm, it puts a lot of stress on the thread right about in that point right there, right about in that point right there where that thread guide is on the bottom. See that? It puts a lot of stress on that thread. And that's why the Swedish on these upper tension units has that little plastic tab on the bottom that you can slide. And I showed that to you in a recent premiere. Let me grab it real quick. Hold on a second. Uh, while I grab it, I'll swing this around so you can see kind of what we sewed. And again, I kind of regret that I didn't make the stitch length shorter. I should have made the stitch length shorter. Yeah, I should. It's a, it's a beautiful pattern, but it's not tight enough. And I could have fixed that very easily by making that stitch length a little bit shorter and it would have pulled that together like that. But as you work with these Swedish beauties, I'm looking for it, looking for it. As you work with these Swedish beauties, you might be changing types of thread. Maybe you're working with 100% silk. Maybe you're working with that, uh, that nasty, nasty thread that I talk about all the time. I kind of rant about it. Maybe you're working with 100% rayon thread. Like this stuff. I almost got it. Almost got it. Maybe you're working with a thread like this stuff. This 100% rayon stuff that is rated at 40 weight, but it's incredibly fragile stuff. 
And so if we're sewing a stitch like this, any one of these stitches, if you're sewing with a stitch like that and you've got it threaded up with this 100% rayon stuff coming across the top, coming around the uh, tension discs, over that take-up spring, underneath the thread guide, through this take-up arm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, this stuff being very prone to breaking is going to be stressed by this take-up spring going full range of motion. It's swinging all the way down. It's pulling hard all the way back up because part of what this take-up spring does, part of what that take-up spring does as it's going, that's not in focus right now. There we go. Thank you. As this take-up spring is going up and down very rapidly, bump, 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 as it's going up and down right now, the further range of motion it has to swing and going all the way down, coming all the way back up, the more it's going to put stress on that thread and the more likely that thread is to break. So the Swedish being as smart as they are, they said, we're going to offer a solution that will help with that. It may not always prevent it, but it may help. So they developed their upper tensions. I'm trying to get it out of the bag here. They developed their upper tensions with a small adjuster. I'm so close to being there. Bear with me. And this is going to be a slightly different uh, upper tension. Similar, but different. They developed it with this little tab on the bottom right here. Can you see that? There's a little metal tab. And as you slide that tab back and forth, you control the range of motion for that take-up spring. Right now, it's at a full range of motion. You see it's going all the way up, all the way down. If you want to retard that a little bit and not have it travel as far, thereby reducing the stress on that thread, let's say you only want it to travel that far. You just slide that little tab, and I haven't tried this yet, so hopefully it moves because it might be frozen. Ooh, it is frozen. Ah. Ah. Gumdrops. Well, at any rate, this one, this one you can see has it, it's not cleaned, it's it's sitting in a bag and it's not ready for use yet. But as you slide this little tab, and it's going to be on upper tension units similar to this, as you slide that tab, it's going to push down or slide down that upper tension spring so that instead of traveling here to here, it's only going to be traveling like from mid-range down and back up like this. By traveling less, it's going to put less stress on the thread and it's going to reduce the likelihood of that thread breaking. That's why they came up with it. I'm sorry I couldn't slide it. This thing is all gummed up right now, and I wasn't ready for that. Urgh. Nope, it's it's frozen. So there you go. But anyway, I wanted to explain that because this upper tension on Patty's machine also has that little slide tab on it as well. So you can, you can decide how far you want that take-up spring to travel as it's going through the, uh, the sewing process. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful feature. It truly is. All right, let's pull this out and take a look at this. And again, I kind of regret I didn't make it a little bit shorter, but that's okay. It's a different looking stitch than it would be if it were shorter, right? Yeah. Okay, let's adjust the camera again. So these are the stitches we've done so far. On the far left is stitch number one on revised cam B. The one in the middle, the snaky one, as Emma described it, is stitch number two. And then finally, the one on the far right is stitch number three that we just did. And again, you can change the look of these dramatically by deciding where you want to set that stitch width, as long as it's between one and four, and where you want to set that stitch length. And again, generally, not always, generally for 
cam generated stitch patterns like this with the Swedish beauties, you want to be right around 0.4. But depending on the pattern, like this pattern that we just sewed on the far right, I'm not happy that we, I'm, I'm not, I wish I had gone shorter. That's what I was trying to say. I wish I had gone a little bit shorter to tighten it up more. So you learn as you become familiar with your machine and these stitch patterns on these cams, how you want to set that sweet spot to get the look that you like. Someone else might look at that stitch pattern on the far right and go, no, that's exactly the way I would do that. That's exactly the way. Someone else would look at it and, and be in my mind, my way of thinking and say, nah, I'd make it a little bit tighter. But the final result is you get beautiful stitch outputs from this green machine from this CL21A from 1959. Hold on a second. Yep. 1959 is when this machine was born. And what, what are we going to see on the back? Let me get a little bit closer to the camera. Not that close, Scott. I'm looking over my shoulder while I'm doing this. If you go, why can't you keep it more steady, Scott? Because I'm not even looking at the material right now. I'm looking at the laptop screen so I can see what you guys are seeing. <laughs> All right, let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch. That, folks, that is absolutely page 34. I haven't even said page 34 during this live stream. What is wrong with me? But that is absolutely page 34 as far as our stitch balance for that lock stitch. Lock stitch is always going to be tougher to generate because of the factor of pulling that thread back up through the nap and the thickness of this protected full grain leather. But we've got a real good balance right now where we're getting a nice top stitch. We're getting a very nice lock stitch. It's, it, they're working together. They've become friends. I don't know if they went out for coffee or what they did, but they're all of a sudden friends now. And we're getting a good balance between the lock stitch and the top stitch. So that's what we want. That's the kind of balance we want. All right, let's move on to stitch number four now which will be our last our last decorative ornamental type stitch that we can do on this cam again in position 5 we've already done we've already done 1 2 3 now we're going to do 4 and then if we go to 5 all we're going to see is a zigzag position 5 on this cam setting over here is always going to be 5 is always going to be a zigzag so right now we're on 3 what we're going to do now is we're going to recalibrate Whenever you're changing this slider and you're going to another stitch pattern selection, you recalibrate that stitch width down to zero, which retracts that finger from the cam. And then we're just going to slide this into position four now, like that. And then we remember to bring our stitch width back to four. And we're all set to sew that last decorative ornamental pattern that is on the revised cam B that's in the back of the machine. All right, you guys ready? And I know this, this live stream is going a little bit long, but we covered a lot of stuff. We talked about all kinds of stuff. We answered questions. We learned together. It takes a little bit of time, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. All right. And I did better in the last two rows. Hopefully, I can sew relatively straight on this final stitch off on this protected full grain leather, which again is going to be stitch pattern number four on revised cam B. And I'm very thankful. Wait, there we go. I'm very, very thankful that I'm not sewing with this type of thread, this 100% rayon, because this stuff is a nightmare. You guys saw me do it on that one premiere, and I was just about ready to take up drinking or something else. Yeah, I don't know if he had a lot of glass and stuff on the floor. He might have. He might have done that. Absolutely. I know the big thing that through those 900 plus times that Edison tried making a filament-based light bulb, the big, 
the big thing that they learned and they eventually developed and perfected more was creating that vacuum environment inside of that light bulb so that the filament would last longer. It wouldn't immediately burn out like the earliest versions. That was a big deal to them. So, all right. So we should be all set up for this, this uh, final decorative ornamental stitch, stitch number four on revised cam B. I'll make sure my take-up arm is all the way up to the highest position. And let's launch into this. Here we go. And again, I'm kind of trying to focus. I won't do it right now. You already saw the take-up arm working. It is working feverishly right now. We'll stop right there. Ah, this is a fun one. We'll see if anybody wants to come up with a name for this one. And I didn't change the stitch length. And this one looks okay to me. This one, I like the look of it with the stitch length that I have right now, which is right around 0.4 on the stitch length. I didn't like the look of this one just before it, but this one I like. It's okay, but I could probably even go a little bit shorter on that, couldn't I? A little bit shorter. You kind of see what we uh, generated there. We take it out. We'll look at it a little bit closer. And I'm pleased to say that during this live stream, the motor has performed beautifully. No explosions, no fire, no smoke. Yay! So here are all of the stitches we did on, again, revised Cam B. Well, I shouldn't say that. We didn't do a zigzag. But imagine that there's a zigzag over here somewhere. Then we did all of the stitch options apart from, a, you know, the zigzag itself. We did all the other decorative ornamental stitching from a cam, revised cam B. That's easier to say it that way. All right. Now I'm actually looking at the screen. So you hopefully you can see more. Stopping for a second so the camera can catch up. There we go. So again, you can change the look of these stitches dramatically by changing the stitch length. Now let's look at that, that lock stitch on the back. Now the interesting thing when you change stitch patterns... Some of them are going to be a little bit more concentrated in how they execute that stitch pattern and also the angular effects of how that stitch pattern is being generated through the cam. So the visibility of them because of the stylization, is that a word, stylization? Stylization maybe is the word. Because of the design and the stylization of the stitch pattern, it's going to present much clearer on the back of the um, protected full grain leather. And you can see that through this particular stitch pattern we just sewed. We haven't changed a thing. We're using the same thread. We're using the same uh, needle, which is quickly becoming tired. And yet the visibility of that stitch is much clearer than the other ones. It's much clearer. Trying to get it lined up here, folks. And you can see as we gradually work across the leather, the nap, is a, the nap is a little bit heavier on this side, isn't it? You can see a little bit more, the nap is a little bit heavier and thicker, and it's a little flatter as we moved over. So that helps quite a bit as well, too, doesn't it?
So I think that this, this really helps to illustrate the power of a machine like this to generate beauty. And there's so many different flavors of beauty as well as it's executing these different stitches that you just saw it do on this live stream. And I really wasn't, I wasn't determined because Swedish beauties, because of Swedish beauties, because of that 1.5 amp motor or that one amp motor as it is. They're already known to be muscular, strong machines. So if I were to sew through a couple of layers of saddle grade leather or elk height, it wouldn't be shocking to you because this is a Swedish beauty. And they, they are very, very strong, resilient machines that can plow through practically anything. But I love to show the decorative soft side of the machine as well to show how it handles that intricacy of stitch patterns like this. And again, it's an all mechanical machine. This is not a computerized machine like a newer quilting style machine that uses uh, a, a, you know, a computer board and things like that to generate the, the visibility and the beauty of the stitch. This is all mechanical. Again, it's being generated by a reading finger, a mechanical reading finger going over this cam as it's turning. And like Braille, reading those bumps to know, okay, Scott said it, so okay, we're going to read these bumps now. And again, it slides in and out, so it's either reading bumps here, 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 or all the way over here. And again, all the way on the end over here, closest to this edge, is going to be our zigzag. Then it's going to be uh, the, the stitch number four that we did. Actually, we did them kind of on a sequence, didn't we? Stitch number four is the last one we did, this one over here. So stitch number four is going to be like right there. Stitch number three, stitch number two, stitch number one, closest to the end over here. It's really brilliant, I think, as it's using a mechanical process, not a computerized process, to read bumps like Braille to ger generate all of this beauty over here. I always say it, the Swedes are very, very smart folks. They just are. So hopefully this has been helpful as, as I've kind of given you a little bit of a glimpse of this machine. We've talked about its journey a little bit. And again, I would strongly encourage you, go to the description it's not going to be up there immediately because I have to cut and paste them all in there. But go to go back to the description tomorrow, the next day, whenever, and look at those progress shots. There's hundreds of progress shots of the journey and the pilgrimage that I took Patty's machine through to get it ready for this live stream premiere today. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. Hopefully we covered some stuff that you walk away saying, I didn't know that. I did not know that. Because that's what these classrooms are all about, is us learning new things. And not just from me, but from each other. So, God bless you guys. I'm going to finally put on a little bit of music. I have been music deprived through this live stream. Oh my goodness, I, I'm like getting a twitch. Yeah, let's get some music going. Yeah, we need some music. So if you've been thinking about getting a Swedish beauty, either because you love power and you want to sew like through crazy thick leather, or you love the beauty of the machine, and I don't have the extension bed on because... When Patty from Texas sent this machine, there was no extension bed. I've got extra ones. I could have could have put it on. And uh, but the extension bed will give you workspace all the way out to here. You know, it's one of the biggest workspaces. It's like a long arm quilter. Um, you know, if you've been thinking about getting a Swedish beauty, reach out to me. I've got a couple available, and I'd be happy to sit down with you and work out a plan that works for you, works for me. And then you can get one of these in your sewing space. Yeah. And you'll be doing this.
I feel like I'm doing a TikTok video right now. I haven't done TikTok at all. Anyone think I should try TikTok out? But I don't know how I would do. Aren't they a, like a limited amount of time? I don't know how I would do like a. I mean, most of my premieres like this one, it's running over two hours. So TikTok, I think, expanded their time so you can do them longer. But originally it was really short. It was like 30 seconds or 60 seconds. There's not a lot I can show you in 60 seconds unless it's just like blasting through a real thick layer of leather or something like that. You know, whoa, something like that through that. I can certainly do that. But I, I've never tried TikTok at all. Yeah. Oh, hi, Susie. Welcome, Susie. Welcome, Dr. T. I think I said hello. I think I said hello to everybody else. I think I did. Yeah, I think I greeted. I'm, I'm scrolling up. I said hi to everybody else, I think. Yep. But again, great to have everybody uh, here. Whether you stepped out into the live chat, which is how I can have you know the opportunity and everyone else can have the opportunity to meet you, or if you stayed in the shadows. I know a lot of the regulars that step out in the live chat now, they were shadow people originally. Some, some of them stayed in the shadows for years. And then finally they stepped out and we could, we could welcome them. So if you're not ready for that yet, that's okay. But maybe eventually, because that would be really super cool. Super, super cool. All right, you guys take care. I'm going to end the live stream in a little bit. Remember, you can continue to chat after the live stream stops for a little bit until YouTube pulls the plug on it. I don't know how long they give us. But great to have all of you here. I know Saturdays and the weekend can be incredibly busy. And I'm so grateful for all of you that took time out of your busy Saturday to join this live stream. And there's so many more things I could show you on this machine. But we've gone so long already. And you've got so many other videos you can watch on this channel showing these Swedish beauties do other things. Super cool things. So, again, if you are tempted about getting one and you don't want to roll the dice and get one on eBay or Etsy or Facebook marketplace and kind of wonder what's wrong with it. Cause as you look at my hundreds of progress shots on this machine, you're going to be like, Holy crap. There's so many things that have to be dealt with these Swedish beauties. They're so high maintenance. Initially they're high maintenance, getting them right, getting them on the, the right page, getting them optimized. And then it's just basic maintenance to maintain them. It's basic maintenance to maintain them. But again, it's knowing those 130 plus things that need to be done on these machines to get them just right, like, like patties. And then you can just sit back and enjoy them. It's like autopilot then with basic oiling on the machines. And always make sure you get a, an owner's manual as well. I don't know if Patty has an owner's manual. I'll check with her. But I've got these reprints that I did professionally bound, and uh, they're wonderful resources. I decided to print them uh, all in color, so they're a great resource uh, to an owner. And I just recently had somebody contact me ask, asking about that manual, and they're sending in a, a check, and then I'm going to send them the manual out. So another great resource just to kind of know what you're working with because, again, it's like any piece of equipment – Knowing that roadmap of the equipment is going to help you to enjoy it even more. So I think getting an instruction manual is never a bad idea. A lot of people don't, and they just watch my videos, which is fine, because I, I try to show the lay, of land, the lay of the land. I try to explain how the machine works, how to set it up for success and all that. But having this as a resource is, is certainly not a bad thing, having it as a resource. So with that, I'm going to crank on some more music. Again, thanks to everybody. Welcome to some of our newest folks. Like, oh, I said A and W, or I said A W. It's actually A W I, A W I. Yeah. But thank you to all. It's always great to have new folks join, isn't it? It's kind of cool, kind of super cool, super cool. Yeah. All right. Let me put on some more music. Ooh, this is interesting. Where will this song go? Ooh. All 
All right. Happy Saturday. Have, have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, if I didn't, if I didn't cover something that you wanted to see in general on a Swedish beauty, let me know that. But I, I covered a lot in this one. I mean, we, we looked at the motor, we talked about capacitors, we talked about resistors, we talked about a bazillion things. But if I missed something that you wanted me to talk about, send me a note or mention it to the one of the moderators that's in this live stream and they will pass that along to me. So I'll, I'll try to remember to, to do that next time. Yeah. So again, goodbye. The next step for this machine now is I'm gonna pack it up very carefully and send it towards Texas so that Patty can begin enjoying this Swedish beauty now that she can actually sew with it and it's not going to explode anymore. You know, it's you want to sit down to a sewing machine and enjoy the the gentleness and the quietness and the, the beauty of that machine. You don't want to have the 4th of July going on. You just don't. So no more of that. No more explosions. Yeah. Trying to get the right distance here. Almost there. <laughs> sort of, kind of. All right. Oh, I forgot we got a new person that came to the workshop. I'm going to put him over here by the machine. I don't have a name for this guy yet. If anyone is really good at coming up with names and wants to kind of come up with a name for this guy, he's kind of dressed like a soldier. He's got a rifle over here. Kind of see that. We'll have to come up with a name for this guy. All right. Take care, everybody. I'm going to end the live stream. And again, if you want to chat a little bit longer, that's totally cool.